Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the market strategy session. Today is November 15th, 2015. First and foremost, our thoughts go out to those who were part of that tragedy in Paris. Not happened on Friday. Um, just horrible, more madness, um, senseless nonsense. Um, reading now that not only has France taken to the air to bomb some uh, spots, it says the U.S. has also bombed the Libya faction, I believe I just read. So um, there is... Uh, Let's not forget, what? our president did send 50 people over there. Okay, so he sent 50 people over. <laughs> well, maybe they're all special forces people. That's enough to staff, you know, two football. T- no, not even a football team. Right. Well, anyway, politics aside, it's a terrible tragedy, as we're aware. So our thoughts are with those who suffered a loss, or our friends over there. Are just terrible. It's just more nonsense. But we're, tonight we're going to focus on the market. We're going to talk about. Um, how this affects the market, what we could be looking for. Let's go over the economic reports like we always do. Draghi speaks at 5.15 in the morning. That's going to be interesting. Then Empire State Manufacturing, CPI on Tuesday, building permits, and the FOMC minutes, which can move the market. That's Wednesday. Weekly unemployment claims at 8.30 on Thursday, Philly Fed at 10. Draghi speaks again on Friday. The futures are down 10 points at 208.50 into the 50-day moving average. Did trade down to below 2,000 before reversing. So the question now is, okay, after the two-day washout Thursday and Friday, I was looking to see how much further this could go to set up yet another buying opportunity. We talked about that in the mastermind session, specifically what we're looking for to pick up. But the question is, will the gap down and subsequent morning trade on Monday be enough to clean up this pullback? Or... Will it act more as a pause? Because we don't know where it's going to enter, you know, where it's going to wind up. I mean, a 10-point gap down is not that big. could easily be faded. It could easily be gotten back throughout the session, whatever. So it may just turn out to be a pause day. You know, one of the things, and again, not saying that lives in Paris don't matter or any of that crap, so don't read deeper into this. I'm talking just from a market perspective. Usually events that are outside U.S. soil – usually do not, the, the effect is not usually longer term. It's, they're usually shrugged off pretty quickly. So the question is, will that happen once again tomorrow? All right. Anyway, that's all I have, at least. I want Paul to Paul go in more, you know, Paul go in deeper with this. Uh, can you see the questions, Paul? I cannot. But I'm not sure I agree with your last comment. What, um, what comment is about it? events outside the U.S.? When you go back to like you know uh, when the Sing- when you had the Singapore currency crisis in '97, we collapsed 600 points. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, Russia- I'm talking about terrorist uh, econ- terrorist oh, okay. attacks. Gotcha. Because well, I mean, I'm not sure that I would say this. It's inconclusive because thank God. We don't have. Whoa. You there? there? Paul, did I lose you? Nope. I can hear you. Okay. No. What did you say? Well, what we had. You know, thankfully, we've got 9-11 is a terrorist attack. And then you had, you know, Oklahoma City and you had the, the, the early 90s World Trade Center. Um, All right, but what about the London bombing? What about the the train in Spain? What about the? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<clears throat> I'm just not sure there's, you know, I guess a lot depends on what kind of shape the market's in and how it ra rallied or sold off into that. It would be my um, would be my comment. Right. Um, I mean, I think it's expected that France is going to bomb, and you know, the Kurds had a big victory today, but um, it what, what's I'll use the word interesting because I can't find better words right now. That um, you know, France has always been the country that pushes back any time the U.S. wants to get involved internationally. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. So meanwhile, they, now they're the ones in the crosshairs, and you know, their president, who's been an unmitigated disaster politically and economically. Um, all of a sudden now wants to have World War III. Um, very, you know, I, I love the, the, a study of ISIS's strategy by a psychi psychologist, psychiatrist would be amazing because they're hitting the people that really don't want to even get, like the Russians. Why on earth would you go blow up a Russian of all the people to go screw with? I mean, the Russians really don't care about much. Why would you go poke that bear? Um, what's the beef with the Russians besides that Russians are going to go into a little bit into Syria? I mean, I, if I thought ISIS was big beef is with the U.S., next thing you know they'll go after China, which would be another big mistake. And I, I can't figure out what their end game is because if they go after France and Russia, and that brings those countries closer to us. Then you get a worldwide concerted effort against them, and then it's game over. I mean, if if you had any other president but this clown, um, it would have been game over months or quarters or even a couple of years ago. But the fact that we got a guy that can't even use the word Muslim is 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 beyond a joke. And actually, Hillary Clinton's no better. So, get you know, kind of dovetailing into the market. I, I did it. I, I gave a, a talk this morning to a group. And um, it was interesting. We began the, the, the group the day, and I said, you know, I don't. I'm honest. I, I am a Republican, and I'm and I'm very, you know, kind of pro defense. And I have no problem being the world's policeman. And half the group disagreed at it right out of the gate. So it was an interesting talk um, that really centered around terrorism's effect on the markets. I told Tiny when I was driving at some point today, because I was driving all over the place, that um, <clears throat> I thought we'd be down, you know, one to two percent. So you know, twenty to forty S and P handles, <clears throat> and we're down, you know, nine right now, and we've come back. What were we down at the low, Tiny? We we're probably down another ten. So we we're probably down one percent at the low, and we've rallied back half that. Yeah, just um, about just about one percent, you know, whatever it is. So that's um, that's in very you know in minutely short term terms, that's on the resilient side and bullish because I thought we'd be I thought we'd be down more given um, the extent. This is not some one coward in a in a in a bomb vest. This is an incredibly concerted effort which. You know, diabolical you want, but it was a, it was incredibly well coordinated and orchestrated. This is not a bunch of guys filling up fertilizer in, into a pipe to explode. This is this is clearly a lot of organization went into this. And I think the scary part, which I'm surprised the market's not absorbing, is that they say on the, on the internet there was absolutely no chatter. This was coming at all, which means the enemy is getting more sophisticated. So. Um, in any case, a, uh, a, an ETF like France, my first reaction, which is EWQ, uh, would be one to sh that I'd short against. And I have not done my homework on what's in EWQ, but I could certainly can. My first reaction would be into any bounce, short EWQ against maybe a basket of European stocks. Maybe you buy VGK and you short EWQ. Because it's hard to believe that the French economy 
is going to recover really quickly from this. So let's see what's, what, what's in EWQ to make sure we're not shorting like ExxonMobil. So Sanofi, the oil company, BNP Paribas, Louis Vuitton. So the question on these holdings would be how much revenue do they get derived from France? If it's a lot of revenue, I think that's a, a potentially a good trade to be short France and long, you know, like VGK. So it we'll look something like this. So as this line goes down, you make money. Line goes up, you lose money. So that seems like a reasonable play into any little bounce whatsoever, but we'll see. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, so let's start. We, so we know the market's right now down, but it's a down a lot less than I thought it would be. Hmm. So here's the Dow. We'll go through the indices. Let me let me start off by saying um, the pullback that we had to end last week. Let me expand it a little bit. The pullback we had to end last week was certainly deeper than I thought. So when someone said to me, you know, what kind of pullback would you buy? I said one to three percent, and I think we're probably right about at th right about three percent. Eighteen thirty-six, fifty-four, five points. Yeah. So this is. I said one to three percent. We're probably right at three percent right now, as uh, as the deepest pullback that I saw. I didn't think Thursday and Friday would be this deep, but it was. Um, <clears throat> if you read my blog on Friday, Invest for Tomorrow blog, I said you know, I, I thought the pullback would not have been this deep, but given that it was, we probably have more downside to go. But I do think we're going to see some kind of intraday reversal this week. Friday is the most unlikely day to make a bottom. Bottoms have occurred on Friday. From memory, September 21st, 2001, the 9-11 low was on a Friday. And I'm sure there are a lot of others, but I always remember that one because it was my one of my bachelor parties, and I was playing golf at Whistling Straits in Wisconsin. I woke up. The Dow was down 600 pre-market. I bought the opening, which I thought was brilliant. And then I sold the clothes, made some money. <clears throat> I did it from the golf course, and then lo and behold, the market takes off and screams higher from there, and I make like half a percent, and I could have made 18 zillion percent. Oh well. In any case, so markets pulled back deeper than I thought. Uh, I think this week I would imagine we are going to see some weakness. Uh, Tiny would probably say maybe to the 50-day moving average. I don't know how deep we go, but I do think. You know, another one to two percent, and then you start looking for a down opening and firming and reversal during the day. This is continuing to look like 2011, which I've mentioned before. Uh, 11, this low is a lot deeper, but the time in between bottoms, the top, and the rally looked a lot looks a lot like 2011. So. In November of 11, we had a very deep pullback, and then we took off to new highs. So that's the Dow. S&P looks almost the same. <clears throat> We're closer to the 50-day. We will probably pull stochastics all the way back down to fully oversold, which is kind of like we like to see, but we're not there yet. Uh, if we did a Fib grid, which is more of tiny strength than mine. You know, a 50% retracement gets us another 1% lower. Um, here they are. They had a deeper pullback on Thursday. Not as bad on Friday. Now they're coming more into line with the other indices because they've gone down less. Um, I still believe that this peak will be exceeded before the end of the year on the mid caps. 
And the smalls also traded really well on Friday. Friday was a very small down day in the or down less than one percent um, in the uh, Russell. So again, deeper pullback, but I think the next leg higher. Well, I say I am. I, I believe it's going to go higher because I own the small caps, the mid caps. So if I don't think they're going to go higher, then I got the wrong positions on. And the cues, which I mentioned twice already, that uh, sentiment was really bullish up here. And it doesn't mean the cues have to go down, but I think their period of severe outperformance is done. I said the question will be, can we close this gap? And the answer now is emphatically, yeah, because we're essentially there. So on the next leg, the cues will go, I think they go to all-time highs again, but I don't think they're going to be the leadership index. Europe, um, we talked about being in no man's land, and I still think it's in no man's land. At some point this week, Europe's going to be a buy this week for a trade. EEM, which I put on, I uh, shorted EEM uh, to begin the week. All right, do it end of last week. I oh, begin the week, I think. So EEM, what I did was I kept my little position. So I own a small position in FXY, and I own a small position in Hong Kong, EWH. And I kind of liked those positions. I didn't want to sell them. <clears throat> so what I did was I just shorted EEM against it. So my overall exposure is zero, but I believe the China and the Hong Kong ETF will outperform EEM. So let me pause for a second and go back to the question window. Uh, give, me, give me one second, guys. Okay, let's see all the questions. <clears throat> Got, uh, Scott, the guy who was with me on pain, whose name is that's embarrassing. Last name begins with an S. What the hell is his name? Dan something with an S. <clears throat> Super nice guy. Um, and not to, I, I was surprised he's on so much because he doesn't really run any money. He has a tiny, tiny little client base. I can't figure out why he's such a regular guest. Not that I'm some. Not that I'm Warren Buffett. Um, but he has a Dan Schaefer. That was his name that I was on with. Um, <clears throat> so when I was on, on pain on Thursday, the green room where you hang out before you go on the show was a complete zoo. They had like, I don't know, 15 guests on the show overall. So it was kind of crazy um, in the green room. And I kind of just keep to myself. I sit in the corner. Um, I get my work done. And Geraldo Rivera's daughter is one of the girls, women, excuse me, but she's young because she's a girl, who like takes care of you in the green room. And I always BS with her. She's young and very, very attractive and could not be any sweeter. So I always BS with her. But the, the lunacy in that room was, was, was crazy. So many people coming in and out. And embarrassingly, I didn't know Bo Deedle came in. He's the guy that um, went after the good, remember the movie Goodfellas? He came in the green room. He was going to be on. I didn't know who he was, so I was the only one. Everyone's falling all over him, and uh, I was embarrassed. That I didn't realize that's who it was. Oh, well. In any case, uh, let's see. Uh. <clears throat> let's see. Dan and yogurt. Uh, golden bond should benefit. Well, Dimitri, certainly bonds are going to benefit, <clears throat> although they're, <clears throat> although they're not, not, not that much. Last I checked, bonds are up like a quarter of a point. Jason asked, could this be a head and shoulders? Let's take a look in a second. And Kurt asked, does IWM, yes, Kurt, IWM is the Russell 2000. Jason, what index are you talking about? I assume you mean like the S&P. Is this a head and shoulders? Let me dial down to a 65-minute chart. So, I it, let's get rid of this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, 
so I'm strict with my head and shoulders. I don't believe they work in the indices, but let's say for a minute this is a stock. This, I guess you could call it a head and shoulder. It's a little, I mean, it's more like a rounded top. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you'd call the left shoulder. Maybe this, and this is the right shoulder. You could, I guess you could call it that. But you, 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 you essentially met the objective already. So we're kind of at the bottom of that objective. All right, let's bang ahead to the uh, major indices, which have been trading really well. Banks, KBE. Um, so, oops. you know, through Wednesday, I'm thinking, all right, we have two reversals. Boy, if the banks could hold on for another couple of days and squeeze the shorts, they're going to blast off to, to a 10% rally. And we found out they can't do that. Does that uh, impact my call for the banks? No. I think the banks are heading back to 40. So from 35 to 40, I think it's a pretty good run. But the banks still look fine. The trannies, the trannies hung in really well Thursday and Friday. They've done nothing to really disturb what I think is going to be a nice couple of months in the trannies. Uh, this one, this funky candle is the Norfolk Southern takeover rumor, right there. But the trannies still look okay. The semis uh, sold off, but not. Wasn't a disastrous sell-off in the semis. They're okay. Not great, but they're not disastrous either. And finally, the consumer, that did get hit <clears throat> on the Nordstrom news from, I think, Thursday night, if not Friday morning. Because look at retail. Retail was obliterated. And, of course, it was because I have a new client who came in, and they owned XRT, and I said on Wednesday, all right, do I sell it here or do I wait for a little bounce? And, of course, I said, let's wait for a little bounce. So uh, it was <clears throat> – I'm not asking for pity, but I had a really crummy week essentially across the board, which definitely happens. I just would rather not have a crummy week. Uh, so that's XRT. XOY is the weakest of the four key sectors, but it's, it's, I don't, it's done nothing – to upset the apple cart. It's still in a bullish formation over the intermediate term, and we'll look for some more weakness and then a reversal. Those are the four key sectors. None look bad. It still supports my thesis of higher prices. Secondary sector software, same thing, still looks fine. Buy it in a weakness. Uh, telecom, uh, frustratingly non volatile and slow, but I Market, you know, probably market performer if I had to use the Wall Street lexicon. Not great, not awful pair of twos. Uh, diversified financials look a little better than the banks. They look fine. I think they're going to go higher. Which I think Johanna asked last week for insurance. Insurance trades really nicely as well. Um, barely down at all on Friday. Look for insurance to lead higher with a little more weakness. Yes, I see there is a divergence. But I think insurance is going higher. Uh, and the home builders... <clears throat>
Friday's action was really, really important. Let's see what happens this week, but that should be on your um, on your watch list. XLE Energy he got hit very hard Wednesday and Thursday, but look what happened on Friday. Trying to hold the 50-day moving average for the second time in two months. Question mark, question mark. Key week for XLE. And here's OIH, which actually closed unchanged. Nice candle Wednesday, I'm sorry, Thursday and Friday in energy. So the sectors do not look disastrous. All right. Um, let's see. XLV, which is healthcare, which I no longer own, traded fine on Friday. Bad Wednesday and Thursday, hung in on Friday. And look what biotech did on Friday. Big, big volatility candle on Thursday, hung in on Friday. Internet, which I do own, traded very well Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Got hit pretty good on Friday, but still just was at all-time highs uh, last week. <clears throat> tan, I know a couple of you guys like the tan. I said, eh, eh, nothing, pair of twos. Look for a reversal. Maybe you'll put in another low below 26. Reverse, and then maybe you can get a big run going in tan. So, oh, so far, none of the sectors look disastrous. Now, here we go with a couple of crummy. Here's IYR, does not look good. Um, it's, it's a defensive, lower interest rate sector, does not look good. XLP, consumer staples, which I own a piece in. Uh, I thought that was it was going to reverse here. It did not. In all likelihood, I am going to kick this, take my loss. Uh, I bought this poorly. I just kind of get what I deserve, or deserve what I get. <coughs> and then I'll rotate. I'll probably buy some more internet this week. And then the last one was the Utes, which I did sell as well. Took my loss, moved on in the Utes. Um, the defensive sector is still a crummy, which would kind of argue for that Fed rate hike I talked about last week. And lastly, oops, gold and silver stocks. I bought them last week here on Monday. This is not an inspiring looking trade. I bought them, I'm holding on, but typically when gold bottoms for in earnest, it's a V bottom. This is, I'm worried that the bottom falls out of this, which means I'll stop out and move on. All right, now I shall pause and answer your questions, which there aren't many. Uh, Johanna, is it not true that you do not like long red candles. Johanna, you are correct. You said XLY. And my friend Ron in Hawaii made a rule about it. I hate tall red candles. <clears throat> tall red candles you want to see during a big decline because then you get a nice reversal candle out of it. But I hate tall red candles when I'm long an ETF or anything for that matter. I do not like that look. That is the bears in full control and is pretty strong selling. Now, if I was short, I would love them, but I'm not, except for EEM. All right, Dimitri, all indexes do have striking resemblance to 2011. No question about it. All indexes do have striking resemblance to 2011. No, no, oh, you repeated that. Yes, thank you. Uh, there's a question. Benji, your Benji, may, oh, the VIX. Uh, Benji VIX. Yeah, the genie's out of the bottle on the VIX. <clears throat> the futures now. Nothing. Okay. So on the VIX, yeah, we, I mean we could certainly spike to 25 without any big deal early this week on the VIX. Will we? I don't know. You know I, I have a tough time with 
putting the VIX trades together because like the VXX, if you want to play it to the long side, is a terrible, terribly constructed ETF. Terribly. Um, because of the way VIX futures roll. So I don't love the CTF. All right. Any other questions? And then we shall move on. Uh, okay. So let's move. Oh, let's go to, um, before I forget, which I normally do. Here is the AD line. It's just pulling back. Nothing to speak of bearish or bullish here. JNK, uh, which I said last week I was out of, thank God, um, has gotten bludgeoned. Let me say this about JNK for those of you who care. I spoke with one of my childhood best buddies who runs, who used to run a couple of high yield desks and now runs a credit hedge fund and he said to me, he did tell me when I bought it up in here, somewhere in here. He said, I think you're playing with fire. I hit the high yield market still looks bad to me. So now that I got out of it, and he said, I told you. Um, he said to me, I don't think, I spoke to him on Wednesday, and he said, high yield's got further to go. We either need sharply lower prices to get interest back into high yield, or we need some positive catalyst, because right now, there's absolutely no liquidity in high yield. The few high yield sectors that are hanging in, healthcare was one, and I can't remember the other one, are so overpriced, people don't want to buy them. And metals, mining, and energy high yield bonds look awful and possibly on the verge of some default. So he said he would not go near high yield. And boy, do I, do I wish I listened to him. But I didn't. Not the first time. <laughs> it won't be the last. I screwed up. All right, that's J and K. I have. I can't imagine I'll trade this week. PH. Uh, here's the plain high yield from Pimco one, which I did own, then I stopped out of. Same thing. Looks like it's going to go lower. <clears throat> So now let's head into let me see. Uh, jets, airline stocks. <clears throat> I tell you, I'm really interested to see how airline stocks trade tomorrow. Um, if airline stocks ignore the terrorist attacks, then um, this may be a group to play into January because conventional wisdom would say that you know these these lunatics are going to try to go after a plane like they did with the Russian plane, or maybe do something else to a plane, and that would impact uh, the airline industry. But if if we get by tomorrow and the airline industry trades well, but that that could be one in the year end. Okay. Alrighty. Let's see. Uh, TLT, the bond market. I've said it for weeks and weeks and weeks. To me, it's a pair of twos. Sloppy could go either way. I still have no opinion. I'm sorry to say. Uh, let's see. We did that. The dollar, which I, as you know, I have been bullish on forever, is trading great. Um, we're probably getting towards the end of this intermediate term rally, but it should have another kick in the rear end to go higher. Maybe we ring the bell at parity at 100, I'm sorry, at par, excuse me, at par, at par, and then we pull back. I don't know, but it looks like the dollar still wants to go higher, which means... The euro still maybe want to go lower. I don't think we're hitting 100 or parity yet with the euro, but that's coming soon on the way back down to at least 80 long term. FXY, the yen, uh, bounced a little bit. I'll say the same thing I've said for several years, short any rally in the yen. 
going to resolve 25 to 50 percent lower. Um, gold. Wow, gold has just been. This is this is in the historic selling. Look at the red. Every day has been red. That is pretty unbelievable. Um, that is. And the, the, the worrisome thing if you're a gold bull is that the commitment of traders, the smart money during this decline is not really increased. We haven't shaken out the, uh, the, the dumb money and the smart money isn't buying. That's really disconcerting if you're a gold bull. So maybe it bounces tomorrow based on the uh, terrorist attack, but the landscape for gold is still not bullish yet. I'm sorry to say, if you're a gold bull. Copper had a terrible week again. Um, <clears throat> smart money continues to be long copper and losing. I don't have any words of wisdom here other than wait it out. Natty gas, which I've said for several weeks, I do like and have liked it since this low. It's very, the longer we go without filling this gap, the more bullish it is. So I don't know what happens tomorrow, but I'd be a buyer in a weakness, and I'd certainly, I continue to believe that natty gas is going higher. Crude got bludgeoned last week. Crude's been very tough to, to, um, to wrap your arms around. It's moved in fits and starts, and it hasn't conformed to anything of kind of historical norms. So you would think that tomorrow crude has a three handle in front of it. Maybe we flush the old lows. Maybe we retest. I don't know, but it's been, at least for me, uh, a challenge in both directions. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me pause, look at the questions for a second. Johanna asked about XIV. Johanna, yeah. So I'm going to look to trade XIV uh, this week. XIV will bottom when the stock market bottoms, but it's like buying a six leveraged S&P. So you better be right. But I'm going to look, you know, down in the low 20s to buy XIV for a quick trade. Will it be tomorrow morning? The only way it will be tomorrow morning is if the, the market opens down huge. It's got to be a really big down opening for me to buy. Let's see. Um, the selling in gold is somewhat historic. Um, it's this, it's been worse than any time on the chart. And this is, they're going to ring out all the weak-handed holders. And I don't be surprised if at some point before the ultimate bottom comes, we get like a 100-point down day or two days, $100 down day or two days in gold. <clears throat> so this is where people say, what are you, out of your mind? I do think if we can get this smash in gold well below 1,000, to me, that will set the stage to go to 2,000. And you're like, what? I do think that's the case. So if we get a smash in gold, I think we're going to 2,000 at least. I had a long time target in gold of 2,500, which has not been um, hit yet. So we shall see. Okay, <clears throat> let's go on. Let me see if I answer the questions. Uh, Richard said, Natty Gas looks a couple percent higher. Fine by me. And let's see. Oh, I know I was going to say. So, Scott, if you're still here, this one's for you. <clears throat> we talked about what emerging market countries would do poorly 
in a really strong dollar who have the most dollar denominated debt. I did do my homework and I found a list of countries that have really high dollar denominated debt. I didn't bring it home, I didn't bring it back here, of course. I just know that Malaysia was the biggest one. It was like 30% of their GDP is in dollar denominated US debt. Uh, dollar dominated debt. So this one would be one to be short against countries that didn't have a bunch. So you could almost put together a portfolio of have and have nots. The have nots would be the ones that had a ton of debt denominated in dollars. Let's see. But I'll bring the list back next week. Yeah, Benji, I know Cowboys lost their seventh straight. It kind of sucks when your seven-year-old pats you on the back and says, Dad, it's it's okay. They'll win again someday. But they sucked. All right, let's wrap it up and do the other commodities. Because it was there was a lot of interesting stuff this week. I mean, the grains did not trade well. Here's wheat. Wheat fell out of bed. And this looks like you know wheat wants to fall out of bed one more time so here's a trade going to the week to be short wheat does not look good you have a very tight stop and just above Thursday's high but wheat's a short corn kinda of, sorta of the same thing does not look good looks like it wants to go lower in the short term flush out this low here beans uh, kind of the same thing, does not look great, looks like it wants to fall out to new lows once again. Sugar bounced, sugar's been very, very volatile. Now we know this last leg higher, smart money started getting short. So now this is being driven by the dumb money, which doesn't mean it has to go down right away, it just means that dumb money is, is piling into sugar. Um, and now you are kind of right back near, near near highs again. I don't really have a comment other than that. Here's cotton, which I said is for a couple of weeks is, is is a short. And now I I'll probably say I'm neutral. Pair of twos. We got volatility spiking, but the bears can't make any headway, and neither can the bulls. So I don't really have an opinion on cotton going into the week. Cocoa had a nice week. Uh, looking to break out to new highs. For me at least, it's probably a little too stretched to the upside to hop on board. And finally, coffee. One day, coffee's going to go up. One day. After new low, after new low, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Scott, what do I make of IBB? You know, I told you guys the minute I sell it, it will start. It may do okay. I forgot when I sold it, but I think it was in here. I sold IBB. Um, what do I make of it? Listen, it's tr it, it's trying to absorb and withstand the selling wave in stocks. And um, in the short term, it looks like there's money flowing back into it. Let's see what the volume was in some of these stocks. <clears throat> yeah. um, but there's got to be huge implied volatility to sell options in here, Scott. So you get anything else, manage your risk. Don't get, I mean, if you're wrong, it's okay to be wrong. You just can't stay wrong. So if this thing starts to unwind to the downside, you better make sure you're not, um, naked, it's not, not short puts. Or then you got to buy some calls to hedge it out or the stock. Let's see what else we got. Uh, why is the possibility of a small rate hike causing so much volatility? I don't, th so Jay. <clears throat> I don't think that just the prospect of 25 basis point rate hike is causing vol. As I said, I think I said it last week and in one of my newsletters, 
<clears throat> I think it's because once that rate hike genie gets out of the bottle, I think the Fed's going to raise, instead of raising every meeting like they normally do, I think they'll raise every other meeting next year and short-term rates will go to one point one and three eighths percent by the, by December of 16. Because it's a, it's so out of the box for the Fed to do anything once. So that people are worried that we're going to go up and rates are going to go up, up, up. I don't share that view to worry, but there certainly is worry, and that's why you got you know REITs in the toilet, Staples, which I own, are in the toilet, Utes, which I sold, are in the toilet. All right, let's see, what else? Kevin, do you think the stock market will bounce this week? Um, yes, I do. I think we're going to put in a low this week. I don't want to venture a guess on the day yet, but I do think we're going to put in a low, reverse, and then rally from here. Okay. Any any other questions? Any other questions? Going once. Going twice. Okay. So Obviously, as we, oops, as we head into the new week, the only thing that matters really is geopolitical events, unfortunately. So the market will be at the whim of a lot of stuff going on outside this country. There was some China news. I, I didn't pay close attention to it about about their economy growing at 7%. One of their talking heads said that, which is kind of funny because they just make up a number. So what else? Thursday, I'll be on um, Fox Business sometime between 6 and 7 on the Charlie on Charles Payne show. And that's all the media I scheduled. I'm going to go to Philly. Oh, I know it's going to So if any of you guys live near Philly, <clears throat> I'm in Valley Forge. <coughs> Wednesday night and Thursday, and as I leave Valley Forge, and I think I head across 276 to go back to New Jersey and to the city, um, I need like a, a, one of the famous. I, I like Jim's cheesesteaks the best, and I like you know Tony Luke's and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So can somebody let me know if you live in Philly? I need a really amazing cheesesteak place to go to somewhere up in the Valley Forge or King of Prussia, that area. I don't want to have to drive back into Philly and get stuck in traffic. So if you know any great cheesesteak, I don't want good. I want like, you know, Jean, um, like Jim's good, Tony Luke's good, De La Sandro's good, Campo's good. Those that Subway, kind of cheesesteaks. Subway you know. makes a Chipotle cheesesteak now. What? Subway. Oh, get, get lost. Well, what about Jersey Mike's? Jersey Mike's <clears throat> makes a good sandwich. No, I don't want good. I want I, I like I mean if if I have to, then I'll go and just drive back into Philly. I don't want to go to into Philly, but I also don't want mediocre cheesesteak. I get to Philly so infrequently, I want great. So um Scott, am I bringing Scott, you mean my sneakers that never get any use? Ray's cheesesteak? Hmm. All right. Hog Island Steaks in Phoenixville. All right, Scott. It's not usual that, I li that a fellow Jew knows good cheesesteak. You know, I'm a junk food aficionado. <clears throat> so, all right, I'll go look them up. If they're bad, I'm saying you. I'm, I'm gonna mail them to you. 
any anybody else questions, comments, concerns before we wrap it up? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about uh, that. You really got to send me your piece. I'll do it right in a second. I was in the car. I spoke to you twice today. I had a meeting this morning, then a meeting all afternoon, and then I ran to see the end of Katie's basketball game where they lost 43 to 10. No, 43 to 11. So I'll do it right now. All right, guys. Tiny, you have anything else you want to add? That's it. All right, guys.